Hey guys, welcome back to the Tea Party Podcast. It's the country music podcast where you find new friends and new music. And this week I am joined by a banjo pick and up and comer who recently was named an emerging artist by the CMA. And she just dropped a brand new song last week. I'm talking about Lockwood Bar. How are you? I am wonderful. How are you, Ty? I am doing great. Thanks for jumping on here with me. Hell yeah. So before we get too far into it, Let's start just by kind of giving everybody the Cliff Notes version of how you grew up, where you grew up, and how you got into music. Yeah, well, so I, I grew up outside of California, but I have, outside of California, outside of San Francisco <laughs> in California, um, but both my parents are, I have a very large Southern family. My dad's a banjo player. That's how I got into playing banjo. My mom actually grew up here in Nashville. So, you know, I had a very sort of eclectic upbringing. I listened to a lot of Bay Area techno music, but then my parents were raising me on classic country and bluegrass. And um, quite a mix. yeah, so I moved here as soon as I, I moved to Nashville as soon as I could. And I've just never looked back and just <laughs> dove right in. <laughs> so, Well, and it's worked out for you so well. And one thing that kind of sets you apart, I think, especially in Nashville is that you're the banjo player and lead singer, and that's not something that you see a whole lot of. It's not. Banjo is definitely making sort of a pop culture comeback, but it's not so much a front frontman instrument. And frankly, I think it's underappreciated. It's such a diverse instrument. Um, it's, and, I, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons you don't see it with frontmen as much, that people sort of want to pigeonhole the sound. But there's so much that a banjo can do. I mean, hell of a habit. Um, the song I just dropped, it's... You know, it's not your 90s country song, but the banjo fits in perfectly. And I, you know, and so I just, I think that it's, I think that it's ama an amazing instrument. And I think that it fits over so many different types of songwriting styles and vocal styles. So I'm obviously a giant fan. But it does. So how did you get into the banjo? Because I don't think that's an instrument that most people just pick up and start playing themselves. Oh, not at all. Um, it is, uh, well, my dad played. Um, so I actually have his banjo with me in Nashville. It's a beautiful Gibson. Um, it is, it's an RB250 and uh, they don't even make them anymore. It's this gorgeous five string. Um, I, I could go on for hours. The action is perfect. Um, the strings get an amazing sound. With my dad's blessing, I got a pickup put in it so I could plug it into a sound system. Um, and that's, so that's what I tour with, um, is that Gibson. But yeah, my sister and I both play because of my dad. So, so when was the, the first time that you picked up a banjo? I mean, it sounds like you were pretty young. Um, yeah, I mean, I picked it up as a kid, but then I didn't really get serious about it until college. Like, I think I, I would always mess around on it, but like, you know, we kind of had this family band and so I would play like piano and guitar and we would sing. And then dad was always the banjo player. So when I left for college, um, that's when I got more serious about it. Cause I, you know, I didn't have my dad to just fill in when I performed. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta so, make do with what you've got. Yeah, exactly. So it sounds like, I mean, you guys have been doing music pretty much your whole life. Do you remember your first time up on stage? Um, no, because according to my dad, I was a toddler. He says okay. that we were, we were at a restaurant, um, in Hawaii and there were hula dancers and I just invited myself on stage with the hula dancers. And my dad said that I never looked more comfortable. <laughs> well, it seems so, to have worked its way into, uh, to what you're doing now. Absolutely. No, I mean, I've never, there's no plan B. This was always the one and only plan A. Um, so yeah, I've never looked back. And you're from, you mentioned it, right outside of uh, San Francisco. And I think when people think of California, they think of the Bay Area and they think of Southern California, but they don't realize that there is a lot of true blue collar Northern California where there's some big bluegrass and country followings. I mean, is that kind of how your parents ended up in that or were they part of that scene? Well, they were, they were part of it before they got there. Um, I mean, especially like my mom coming from Nashville and everything. And then my dad had grown up a huge John Hartford fan and, um, and everything like that. So they actually, they really brought that with them. Um, but there is definitely a huge um, cultural pocket, if you will, um, in California. And it was sort of starting to make, I mean, obviously, you know, summer of 69, summer of love, you had all the folk music and everything. And I feel like that sort of subculture was starting to make a comeback as I was growing up. Um, and of course, you know, now there's, um, 
there's a bunch of major bluegrass festivals all through California that are really making it, as, as well as country, actually. I mean, it's really kind of been a surge. Um, so, I mean, it's really exciting because I obviously am, am, am biased. I adore it. So, um, but yeah, um, but I mean, it was, I definitely got the influence from my parents first. And then I remember sort of as it started to gain popularity thinking, oh, finally, <laughs> you know, um, so yeah. What was it like when you moved out to Nashville? Cause you moved out there for school, right? Yeah. I went to Vanderbilt. Um, to be, it, it, in a weird way, it felt like coming home, um, because of, how I was raised. Um, and, and even the music, you know, I sang in church choir growing up and my mom taught me all the classic, um, sort of Southern church hymns <laughs> and sort of soul music and stuff with the guitar. And, and, you know, even, I even joke, my mom's better at cheese grits than she is at pancakes. And so I, I swear coming home to Nashville, it was coming home. I mean, of course, when I got here, everyone was pointing out like, oh, you're such a Californian. And I, so I definitely am a child raised in California, but, um, I, I just fell right into the Nashville lifestyle and, and it just, it fit like, fit like a glass slipper. Um, I love the pace of life. I love the music. I love the food. Um, I love, I love everything about what this, what this life has to offer for sure. And how much different was it for you when you were trying to find gigs or play or even find fellow songwriters in Nashville than it was in San Francisco? I feel like... Oh my God, so much easier. You trip over them. Um, and Nashville is such a sort of community oriented city. Um, you know, everyone co-writes, which, you know, I grew up writing alone. And so I was kind of confused at what co-writing was, but just the whole, the, the way the city functions is one of group collaboration and teamwork and whether it's getting together and having dinner with a bunch of songwriters, it's almost like we're all codependent on each other in a weird way. Um, constantly over at each other's houses, whether we're writing, rehearsing, or just hanging out. And, um, and so it's very uplifting. It's very, it's very much a city that, you know, where everyone kind of believes like high tide raises all boats. So you kind of find your crew and you really hone in on your writing skills and it all just sort of, the ball just sort of rolls. Um, and I really love that part of it. I love that piece of it. Do you think that co-writing with people out in Nashville has, has changed your sound at all? Not necessarily in a, in a bad way, just. You know, oh, hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, because there's, uh, you know, you, it, I, I almost feel like I went to college a second time for songwriting, but just out in the world, you know, like there was, I learned, and I think I learned so much about myself. Like there's so much in songwriting where when you're in a co-write, you have to learn when to stand up for yourself and say, I've got an idea and not be, you know, be, feel empowered in your vulnerability, even that, you know, like you have to sort of push down the, 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 the self-conscious thoughts of, oh, is this a dumb idea? And you have to learn to be vulnerable and say something, even if it doesn't get used in the song. But at the same time, while learning to be vulnerable and, and offer your ideas, you also have to be humble. And if one of your ideas isn't working, you have to step off. And so it's this really interesting dance that you learn to do. And, um, you know, I, sometimes I feel like it's like a therapy session, not just not just because it'll sometimes be a cathartic writing session where you write about something really personal, but also just that, that dance between the relationships of the writers and when to step up, when to step back. And, um, and I've been exposed to so many different types of music and so many different types of, you know, personalities and lyricists and, you know, my rights will be different if someone like I'll write with people that will say, you know, I'm really not in the lyrics, but I love playing guitar and they'll just play some really interesting guitar lick and then we're off to the races. So it's all and, and I love that, too. It's so unpredictable in that sense. So my writing style has definitely changed over the years, but I think for the better because it's just caused me to take more risks and explore more um, and do things that I wouldn't have even attempted writing alone. So, so it's definitely helped you grow a little bit. Who would you say that your kind of musical influences are outside of Nashville? I feel like when I'm listening to your, to your music, I feel a little bit of Sheryl Crow, a little bit of Dixie Chicks. Oh, like, absolutely. Oh. Both of those. I worship at the altars of the Dixie Chicks and Sheryl Crow, 100%. Um, Bonnie Raitt is another big one. Um, Die Hard Bonnie. Um, 
I, uh, let's see who else. Well, I grew up on, on Dolly Parton and Alison Krauss. Um, there was also, uh, an Irish group. They were siblings. So I adored them because my sister and I would sing together, but the cores, they were an Irish pop group. And um, I had every single one of their records, including all of their acoustic sort of broken down ones where they were all playing their instruments just on a stage. And um, so, yeah, I, the, the chorus were, we actually played, I played a chorus song for my sister's first dance. Uh, it was <laughs> the song Runaway. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but um, yeah, kind of across the board. Like I'm, I'm kind of a, my elevator speech, if you've never heard me, if someone's asking like, well, who are you? I say Bonnie Raitt with a banjo. That's a good description, I think. Thank you. Well, I mean, you know, and I don't mean to like sound cocky as if I think I could possibly measure up to Bonnie Raitt because no one ever could, but that's sort of the vibe. Like, I feel like I'm definitely a country rocker for sure. Definitely. And you mentioned, um, you know, an I Irish music. It, I think I read somewhere that you have a cousin in Dropkick Murphy. Oh, I do. Yeah, my cousin Al. He's the he's the lead singer for Dropkick Murphys. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We Where? joke, you know. He's he scream sings, and so we always joke that we should do like a collaboration with me, like being my little country self and him just like raging on stage. Um, I would yeah, be all for that. Yeah, <laughs> he's been such a pillar of strength. Um, you know, because, I mean, he had such a crazy music journey before he ended up with Dropkick Murphys, and he's always someone that is just encouraging me to experiment with my sound, push myself as a writer, um, you know, keep taking risks and, and, and being uncomfortable and trying to grow, and, and I love that, and that's what, that's what he's done, and frankly, that's what Dropkick Murphys have done. I mean, they're always, they're constantly evolving, and I, they're, you know, I feel like each record is better than the last, and so they're, they're such a, such an influence to me, such mentors to me in that sense. I think they've set a great example. Well, you were kind enough to share a couple of songs with us. And I'd really like to give people kind of a, uh, an insight into what your sound actually is. The first one that we've got here is called Best Bad Decision Maker. You put it out in June, right in the middle I of did. The, um, the COVID stuff. Was that something uh, you planned or <laughs> no. you put something out because you were <laughs> No, it was, um, you know, I usually I'd wanted to release it at the beginning of the summer, like May or June, um, because I'm usually on the road most of the summer. And it's always fun to tour when you have new music out. And that's a motivation to reach out to new audiences and everything like that. Um, but obviously, I wasn't able I had to cancel all the tour stints I had planned. Um, but I decided to release it anyways, because it's just fun. It's just sort of it's a lighthearted it's a lighthearted one. It's about wanting to be a little rebellious and not taking life too seriously. And I feel like we all needed a little escapism this summer. And so I think for me, that was part of the motivation where even though I couldn't tour with it, I just felt like it was a happy subject matter. And I thought to hell with it, let's put it out. You know, let's just go for it. I hope people like it. Like we let's do it. So. Well, here, let's let everybody take a listen to it. This one's called the best bad decision maker from Lockwood bar. Summer day. We smoked cigarettes and drank that is cheap wine. Broke a lot of rules and had a real good time. Slide a chance to travel, or she find a way. I was just a baby tagging along. She was a feather in the wind. What could go wrong? She was the best bad decision. Making instigator Living in Monaco 
was that one came out in June. It's called Best Bad Decision Maker by Lockwood Barr. And you mentioned it earlier. You put out another song just last week. But before we get in there into that song, I want to change direction a little bit and talk about a cause that's uh, pretty close to your heart. And uh, for the last decade, you've been a pretty big advocate for suicide prevention. Um, yeah. Can you share why that's so important to you? Absolutely. Um, so I, you know, growing up uh, outside of San Francisco, it's a very uh, affluent area of the country. And, um, you know, even in the poorest neighborhoods, the public schools are some of the best in the country. Like there's just, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of wealth, there's a lot of success, if you will. But we have a raging mental health problem. And the Golden Gate Bridge is one of the top destinations for suicide in the country, in the world, because it's so famous and people romanticize it. And I knew somebody who took their own life every single year of high school. Um, and senior year, it was a, a close childhood friend from my class. And, you know, it, it changed my world. I was never, when that day came, it, I, I was never the same. Casey died and my whole world shifted. And, um, you know, I, and I, I, I think it also took me a number of years to realize that what I really wanted to say to Casey when she had jumped was, Hey, me too. And I think that, you know, we are in an era where I think it's finally becoming a little bit more normal to talk about mental health, but yet suicides are on the rise. Um, I have another close friend who it's coming up, uh, a, a almost more of a mother figure who died by suicide about a year ago. It'll be about a year ago in August, um, second week of August. And we, we don't know how to deal with it as, as a country. And I was definitely more exposed to it because of the Golden Gate Bridge as a child, but it's, it's rampant here in, in Tennessee too. And, you know, I think we need to address the issues that are leading to suicide. Like not, you know, I, I advocated and we're in the process of getting a barrier on the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, but I also think we need to take a look at what we value um, as a society and human connection and joy. And I don't think it's a coincidence that suicides have risen with social media and we're all staring at our phones instead of connecting face to face. And, you know, I also think we need, we need to make mental health coverage and counseling and therapy more common under health insurance. And there, there's so many different components to it, but, you know, without rambling on in, with sort of a can of worms too much, it is something that I am deeply passionate about. And it's, you know, not to sound overly California hippie in this sense, but I really think that if we can heal each other and our mental health in this country, it's like, that'll lead to world peace. I swear, you know, if we can get back to basic human connection and taking care of each other and destigmatizing, taking care of your mental health, I think that so many other things will fall into place. So. Well, and I think you hit it on the head there right at the end, that destigmatizing mental health is one of the, the biggest things that we can do to not just draw attention to the problem, but also help prevent it in the future. Yes. Yes. And I think this, the suicide barrier on the Golden Gate Bridge serves as a symbol as well. Like not only will the barrier literally save lives, but it's also a symbol of us putting our money where our mouths are as, as a society of like, you know, we keep, every time there's a school shooting, politicians get on TV and say, we need to work on mental health. But like, how, how do we do that? And, and I think the barrier on the bridge is a great symbol of us as a society saying, we are putting our money where our mouth is. We are putting this barrier up because we are making a public statement that mental health is important and your life is important. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think the barrier ser will serve multiple purposes in that sense. I, I think you're spot on again here in Spokane. We've got a, a beautiful river that runs right through the city, uh, right through the middle of downtown, but we've got two bridges here that have kind of the same problem locally. And yep. one of them we've put a, uh, kind of a, a barrier up over the walkways. But we also have a, a really passionate group here in Spokane that just goes and leaves notes on one of the bridges that just says something like, hey, you matter. Hey, if you want to talk, here's my phone number. Hey, let's wow. talk. And, and just little things like that. And I think a, a little push in the right direction um, yep. for some people can make all the difference. And you're right, social media has been 
probably the biggest detriment to that because it's so easy to say something nasty to somebody over the internet. Yep. Yep. And it's so easy to feel, you know, and don't get me wrong. I think, you know, social media for me has definitely been a great way to connect with fans around the country. Um, but you know, you can't replace real human connection. Um, you just can't. And, uh, yeah, we need to, we need to get back to that. And so it's, it, I think this will be the cause of my life, honestly. Um, I think it will be something I, I fight for. And, and even days where I feel like there's nothing left I can do or I feel helpless about something, I'm like, you know what? Then I'll just, at the very least, I'll just keep talking about it, you know, and pushing for that destigmatization. So. And that's, that's the right way to go about it. Is there any causes or anything that people can donate that, that you endorse specifically? Yeah, well, so I always say uh, donating to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is always a great place to start. And they are um, very uh, active as far as state legislation. Um, like they campaign in all the states every year to get legislation through that, that whether it's uh, mental health coverage in, in health care or even um, just a resolution acknowledging suicidal ideations, like whatever it might, mental health programs in schools, um, they are really good about researching and sort of pushing for changes um, at, and at the local and federal level as well, but they're very active. So I, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, and the other one is an organization called the Jed Foundation, and they are based out of New York and they focus on um, the preventative stuff, like putting programs in colleges where it teaches people to be there for each other and really sort of like their big thing is suicide prevention, but they are really pushing on the prevention end of it. Like how can we create programs in schools and teach people to watch out for this before it even gets to the level of ideation? Um, so both the Jed Foundation and AFSP are – They've got great information. If you just want to find out more, they're a great place to donate. Um, but yeah, I highly recommend looking into both of those organizations. Awesome. We'll put a, a link to both of those in the description of this podcast. So if you're listening, go out, click that link, see what they're about and donate if you can. And there's not, there's not a real easy way to transition out of this, but I do want to talk about the song that, uh, that you dropped last week. It's called Hell of a yeah. And I heard yes. it for the first time this morning and I've listened to it three or four times since then, and the chorus is stuck uh, in my head. But I want to hear uh, the story behind where this song came from. Oh, gosh. Well, it start, It all started with the title. Um, in, in the co-write, my, my friend Andy said, Hell of a Habit, and she pulled out sort of some poem stanzas that she'd been playing with. And, and Jamie and I, the other two writers on it, we were immediately hooked, and we started talking about sort of the mania of falling in love. And and then got into these sort of like long winded rabbit hole discussions about addiction and how substance abuse and sometimes falling into a manic relationship are the same thing. And, you know, it, it, we just, I mean, it, it was one of those, like, we, then we, we ended up, we were all sipping coffee at the beginning and by the end we were sipping bourbon and just like pontificating about life. And, and so we, uh, yeah, we just went down a rabbit hole, I guess. <laughs> um, because I really do think that there is sort of a mania to falling in love. Um, and I do think that there is a connection between whether it's alcohol or whatever, you know, pick your poison. Um, and we all know what it's like to be around someone who we know isn't good for us. And it's sort of just this overarching. So we wanted to, we just were really intrigued with that that day and, and uh, just dug in. Um, so... Well, here it is for everybody. It's called The Hell of a Habit. It's brand new music from Lockwood Bar.
one was brand new, just dropped last week. It's called Hell of a Habit, brand new music from Lockwood Bar. It, what's the rest of your 2020 look like? I know everything's kind of up in the air, but is there new music or a way that fans can stay connected to you for the rest of uh, 2020? Yes, absolutely. Um, there's, I'm going to be dropping new music. Um, I did a really amazing live stream uh, at the Jars of Clay recording studio in Nashville last week and did it as a benefit for CMA Foundation. Um, and uh, Matt Odemark of the band Jars of Clay set it up so that like the sound system is just stunning. And so it's a really it's the closest we can get to putting our full band in your living room. Um, and so I'm going to be doing another one of those that I'll, I'll make sure to announce on all of my socials and my website. Um, I'm also looking into some drive-in tour options. Um, and, you know, because we can set up a couple musicians on, on a patio somewhere and stay 25 feet away from the cars and have it be sort of socially safe. Um, so I'm, I'm toying around with some options, uh, because I've started to sort of carefully venture out in the last month and it feels so good to be playing again. So I would just tell everybody to stay tuned. I will make sure to announce everything online always. Um, so if you follow me, you'll be the first to know about any, whether it's a virtual concert or a drive-in somewhere. Um, but yeah, my socials are at music by Lockwood. Um, and then it's facebook.com slash music by Lockwood. All my social media is at music by Lockwood, every account. And then lockwoodbar.com well awesome well thank you for jumping on here we end every podcast the same way and it's probably the four toughest questions that i'm going to ask you all Just right i'm ready think, okay 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 here we go the first one if you could go on tour with anybody alive or dead who would it be bonnie ray i feel like i knew the answer to that one before <laughs> <laughs> okay how about this one where were you and who were you with the first time you heard your music being played by somebody else on the radio at a bar at a party and what was that feeling like oh let's see um i was alone in my car um and i screamed um it was on the radio and i lost my mind <laughs> <laughs> um i filmed it on my phone like i mean it was just like losing i lost my mind it was the most exciting surreal experience i've, I've ever had it was just Oh, be still my heart. <laughs> okay, how about this one? What's your favorite venue that you've ever played in? Ooh. Bluebird Cafe. Ooh, that was quick. It's, it's, a, it's Songwriter Church. Definitely. Okay, here we go. Last one. What's your favorite onstage memory? Um... I got hired specifically to play for um, a proposal, a wedding proposal. Um, and it was on the walking bridge, the pedestrian bridge in Nashville over the river. And it was, I mean, to be a part of that was just such an honor. Um, and it was so cool to watch. So absolutely that. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for jumping on here. It's been a good time. And uh, I'm glad that we were able to get some of this information out to people. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Ty. Absolutely. And that was another episode of the Tea Party Podcast. It's the country music podcast where you find new friends and new music like Lockwood Bar and Hell of a Habit.